Episode 9, The Sea, The Sea, The Open Sea, was also named after some writing found in the Pegler Papers. The unique spelling was taken directly from the writing. It's from a poem read by Bridgens late in the episode as Pegler, his partner, lies dying beside him. The sea, the sea, the open sea. It grew so fresh, the ever free. The poem's name was The Sea, and it was written by Barry Cornwall, and is about a sailor's melancholy wish to die at sea. With Pegler dead, Bridgens walks into the desolation of the island alone with the papers, lays down, and awaits to die. He'll lay there for over a decade until a skeleton will be found and the book will be taken back to England, where what's left of its contents will be hailed as the Dead Sea Scrolls of the North, the last record of the Franklin Expedition. When they were first discovered, it was believed by some that the skeleton was Pegler's because of the papers, but very quickly consensus shifted due to the remains of the uniform. We don't know who the man who held the papers was, but very few believe it was Bridgens. But someone often suggested is Thomas Armitage, who served with Pegler for many years. And I don't believe turns up in the TV version of the terror. As for how he died, we don't know, but an Inuit report mentioned crewmen dying as they walked and collapsing on the spot. And the remains were found face down. The episode opens with Liddy Franklin's efforts to raise funds for a rescue expedition to the Arctic to try and save the crews. This is true. For years, she dedicated herself to searching for her husband. Even after she learned of his death, she hired the government, she got the media on site, and she sank a lot of her own money into paying for expeditions. Unlike in the episode, she had an ally in a young Charles Dickens. Dickens, like Lady Jane, was horrified when Dr. John Ray returned with the first information about what happened to the expedition. The Inuit reports of cannibalism. They believed that any Englishman would rather starve than do that. That they could survive anywhere and defeat any obstacle through faith, scientific objectivity, and superior spirit. Now, this is really to be expected because they were literal Victorians, but both Dickens and Lady Franklin were very racist against the Inuit. Here's a quote from Dickens. We believe every savage in his heart covetous, treacherous, and cruel. And we have yet to learn what knowledge the white man, lost, houseless, shipless, apparently forgotten by his race, plainly famine-stricken, weak, frozen, and dying, has of the gentleness of Eskimo nature. Together they claim the Inuit had murdered the crews, eaten them and lied to Ray who by believing them was almost as bad, though bigotry was not the only reason for the reaction. Ray had delivered a blunt report of his findings to the Admiralty, so there be no question about what had been discovered, and the report was released to the press. Liddy Franklin blamed Ray for what she saw as a horrific attack on her husband's character. She wouldn't find out that Sir John died long before any cannibalism took place for years. To make matters worse, Dr. Ray was entitled to a reward she offered for information about the expedition's fate. As she saw it, he dashed her hopes of seeing her husband again, he called her newly dead husband a cannibal, he told the whole world about it, and now he wanted to be paid for the effort. She did not like this man, and she was not alone, and much of the country agreed with her and Dickens. Dickens ended up co-writing and starring in a play called The Frozen Deep, loosely based on the Franklin Expedition and Dr. Ray. Ray was turned into a nursemaid who predicted disaster for the expedition and sought to hurt the heroine. Because villainy. Dickens and Lady Franklin couldn't do much to the Inuit, but they could hurt Ray, and they did. Even though he was probably the most important of the early Franklin searchers, Ray never received the plaudits of his peers. Now, in a brief tangent about the Franklins and racism, by all accounts, Sir John was a progressive governor of Tasmania for the time. But like I said, they were still literal Victorians. They adopted an Aboriginal girl called Mathena, her father was a chief who was captured, so she was taken from her family. She lived in the governor's mansion and was schooled, but when Franklin was recalled to London, she was abandoned in a Hobart orphanage age eight. She finally made it back to her original home in her teens and drowned, drunk a couple of years later. Her remains were exhumed in 1907 and kept by the University of Melbourne until 1985. The town of Athena was named after her. Progressive Victorians are still Victorians. In the Arctic, in the aftermath of the Tumbak attack, there are 32 dead and 23 missing. Many of the missing are Hickey's mutineers. Unlike the missing head, many skeletons were found without heads, probably connected to cannibalism. Either the head was removed to depersonalize the corpse, or the head was used as a mobile food source. The dead are buried, and some supplies are left stacked for Hickey's men, should they return to camp. Some of the men with him made their choice out of fear, and not take away any chance they have to survive.
Lieutenant Hodgson, the only officer among Hickey's men, tears the leather from his boot and chews it. A direct reference to Franklin, known at the time as the man who ate his own boots after his disastrous first expedition to the Arctic. You'll eat your shoes again. You'll eat worse. It was much smaller than the famous Franklin expedition, went overland and everything went wrong. Eventually, a trapper in the group came back to camp with some mystery meat, and after some cajoling, he admitted that it was a party stragglers who'd fallen behind. The trapper was quickly shot in the head. The expedition was eventually rescued by a group of Inuit. Apart from the happy ending, Franklin's first expedition was basically a low-budget indie movie to the Franklin Expedition's big-budget Hollywood remake. You asked me to risk more than doubling that number trekking over distant ground where you know I have lost men in years past. Now Franklin is hardly the only starving man to eat his own boot leather, but I definitely think this was a sneaky reference. The makers of this had done way too much research for it to be anything else. Fitzjames collapses man-hauling officers, traditionally avoided the job unless things were dire. How dire? John Ross rode in a chair on a boat during his own death march to Fury Beach. And that wasn't an unusual level of dickery. But the show also had gore man hauling back in episode two, so maybe I spoke too soon about the whole research thing. The scurvy has been reopening old wounds, and Fitzjames had more than a couple of old war wounds, meaning it hits him harder than most. Crozier doesn't seem to be affected by the scurvy. The only explanation I can think of, besides him being the main character, is that by spending a year getting most of his calories from whiskey, Crozier has avoided a lot of the lead in the tens. You see, one of the many dangers of lead poisoning is that it will weaken you physically. Of course, scurvy won't affect everyone uniformly anyway, and Crozier didn't have any old war wounds that I know of to cause any extra trouble. Though he did have some damage to his hands after his expedition to Antarctica. Days at the wheel without gloves gave him a permanent tremor. He went without gloves because he inhibited his grip on the wheel. Now, please allow me to take a bit of a tangent. Sometimes there's just not a natural space for some information I want to tell you. One of the celebrities that helped Lady Franklin's efforts to send rescue expeditions was Jean Inglow. Not famous now, but in the 1860s she was a bit of a rock star poet. She also might have been in love with Crozier. Quite a few of her works were melancholy, dealing with the sea, sailors, and lost love. She'd been involved with a sailor when she was young, but the relationship was cut short and it seems to have stayed with her. And she did have a brief, chaste relationship of some sort with Crozier. It ended just before his Antarctic voyage that stopped in Tasmania, where he met the Franklins and Sophia Craycroft, who he quickly proposed marriage to. The first time. This was not the first time. It's ironic, but decades later, Lady Franklin, Jean Ingle, and Sophia Craycroft were in the same social circle in London. And I bet that led to some interesting conversations. As more and more men collapse and ride in boats, a little suggests Crozier leave the island and firm, hoping to send men back for them when they arrive further south and find better hunting. Jobson points out that would be a death sentence. It's also most likely what happened to at least one group of men. At the so-called tent place where the Inuit found piles and pieces of bodies strewn among the tents, Crozier refuses. If we are to deposit anything with a view to return at some later date, there will be things, not men." That happened too. For years, the searchers could track the expedition's movements from the items they left behind. Even now, stuff's occasionally found. One thing the show doesn't do an amazing job at is making the passage of time clear. There are sometimes jumps of days, weeks, or months between episodes, or scenes in the same episode. Like now, Hickey's team has almost burned through the supplies they got from the camp, and Hickey is psychologically ready for cannibalism. We need to ask ourselves, what are we willing to eat next? Ten minutes after Crozier left the supplies for them. Hickey's old boyfriend, Gibson, is the first to be eaten. He's too weak from scurvy to pulse, so without a thought Hickey murders him and it's dinner time. Good Sir is forced by Hickey to act as the party's butcher. You can juxtapose this with Crozier's camp. Fitzjames is dying in agony, and his last request, before asking for a mercy killing, is that Crozier use his body to feed the man. Good evening. I am the main dish of the day. May I interest you in parts of my body? Something off my shoulder, perhaps, braised in a little white wine sauce. I certain can Passive cannibalism, the eating of the already dead, is much more common than murdering people to eat them. It's believed that few, if any, of the Franklin crew who were eaten were murdered for their meat. But it's basically impossible to tell from the bones. 
In a nice touch, good sir found David Young's ring on Gibson's body. Young had asked him to give the ring to his sister back in episode one. Good sir forgot until after he'd been buried. Hickey stole it from the body and gave it to Gibson. I like his reaction to finding it. Ambiguous, but with a clear sad confusion. There's a fun detail in Hickey's dinner scene. Most of his team are sitting together and eating with their hands. But Hodgson, the only officer, is sitting alone and eating on fine china, using a knife and fork. He's not the leader, but the class system continues. Crozier administers an overdose to Fitzjames, killing him as painlessly and quickly as possible, but won't allow him to be eaten. He orders his men to bury him as deep as possible so he won't be found. Later on, we see Hickey and he's wearing Fitzjames' boots. So that worked. Blanky's amputated legs become gangrenous and so requests a length of rope and 40 forks. He intends to lead the tomb back away from the rest of the party and do as much damage as he can while being eaten. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just got no more forks to give, and so he'd love some of yours. <laughs> Away from the party, Blanky finds what's now called Gore Point, named for Lieutenant Gore, the Northwest Passage, and enjoys the last smoke, ready to meet his end. What well, in the name of God took you so fucking long? Blanky is fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I don't know for sure, but I think Gore Point was named after him because the decent chance that he found it, the last part of the passage. You see, he went south, returned, and was promoted. We know this from the Victory Point message. So naturally, people assume he found the passage and was being rewarded. I'm not certain, but I think this is an attempt to explain the Franklin Cutlery turning up in random places all over King William Island. Sure, some groups of men might have got lost, or maybe the Toonback was shitting out forks as it ran around the island in agony. Crozier is captured by Hickey's men who killed Tom Hartnell in the attack. Oh. Hold your fire, damn you! Hartnell was the brother of John Hartnell, the second of the crew to die at Beachy Island. John was buried in his shirt. Tom was also one of the men flogged earlier for their treatment of Lady Silence. Honestly, I quite like Tom's arc. He took the flogging as a second chance, a way to wipe the slate clean for what he'd done and start anew. He became much more loyal to Crozier afterwards, even basically taking a bullet for him. His arc subtly demonstrates a difference between then and now. Flogging wasn't seen as barbaric, it was accepted, normal, and respected. The famous Captain Bly of the HMS Bounty is usually portrayed as a brutal flogger, but he flogged much less than most of his peers. It's thought to be one of the reasons he had more than one mutiny against them. Crews were trained to respect force and the captain's word was law. And without the force to back up the law, it was toothless. Also, fun fact, the first British ship to visit the bounty mutineers in the Pitcairn Islands was the HMS Britain. And one of the younger members of the crew was called Francis Crozier. Go on. Go be with your brother now. Over with the Inuit, Lady Silence is told that things aren't going well for the Inuit communities on the island. That there's little game on the island because of the white man. It's not exactly clear in the show, but in the book it's the Tunback that's keeping most of the animal life on the island in its efforts to torment and kill the crews. This difficulty for the Inuit is probably what drove the family a few episodes back unusually far north. One of the fascinating things about the Franklin expedition is the lack of solid facts for much of it. It allows stories based in it to be massively divergent, while pretty much staying to the known facts. The various versions of the story can also be looked at as a series of parallel universes that over time get refined, as new information is discovered and new stories are written that include it, hopefully in broad strokes getting closer to the real events. You can even see this in some differences between the terror novel and the show such as Fitzjames' wildly different characterizations. In the book, he's a bit of an upper-class twit, but in the show, that's a mask, because a lot of the evidence of his life was uncovered in the years after the book's publication. We get one last look at England as Sophia Craycross stands barefoot in the snow, deeply regretting her life choices. Just one more episode to go.